Apprentice on the goal, the win, and the outcome, rather than how do we do it. Yeah? I'm rather, when the great coach has really applauded it, a move that goes out for the keeper, a short kick out to the gate, work it down the pitch, bang, finish, score. So, the, you know, what we emphasize as coaches, kids latch on to it. And particularly in football in England, where that, you know, managing coaches and how they react to the touchlines. Because actually, if you want the kids to be task orientated, you go super crazy every time the score is actually giving the wrong message. All right? So the winning becomes more important than the process. So be consistent in our philosophy and also think the feedback you're giving to kids. Are you rewarding effort and keep them task focused? Or are you more about the winning and looking clever and looking better than the opposition? So the way you, you actually address that gives you a clue. <laughs> so somewhere in there, hopefully it's going to come out when I press it. No, badly shown. Up there it says, we need players with both high task and high ego. We need to manage it so all the coaches and players' egos never get in the way of learning and hard work. Okay? So Ronaldo, an interesting player, everyone sees cocky arrogant or whatever. But if you read the bottom of that, Fergie uh, says, behind the end product of this player is someone who has worked hard to manufacture his game. But not manufacture as in fake it or falsify it. Because Ferguson comes from a, a shipbuilding community. So he understands how things are put together through hard work. So this is a recognition of that guy's mastery organization. Yeah, getting to grips with all the skills and his tactics. And even though he still has an ego. And those were men like sporters, remember Cantona. Yeah? But he was the man who introduced, introduced practice after training at Manchester United. And even Beckham is known for all his practice as well from the same era and still does like free kicks. So as a coach, what do you do? What do you do when your uh, players are successful? You give them loads of praise. When your players fail, whatever happens, what usually happens when teams lose? Hmm? You give out, and what really, what happens to the team talk? Does it get shorter or longer? Normally it gets longer, yeah? Most common is if you, know, you give instructional feedback, and then, but at the same time, just manage it. You know, if you win or lose, it's roughly the same. Successful coach is a broader definition of success than win or loss. Make sure you don't skim over a team meeting when you wait and spend eight on a team talk when you lose. All right, you need equal attention because then you're giving the right message about winning and losing. It's about processes and learning. Why is that type of approach important for coaches?
deliberate practice and highly structured coaching uh, that carried out seriously, explicit rules, lots of adult involved, and the coaches drivers. Deliberate playing was more less less coaching done for its own sake. It's enjoyable. Kids play, they pretend they're playing in the All Ireland, it's two on two, three on three, they put the jumpers down, whatever it's play anywhere, yeah? Versus this highly structured thing. And then of course it's really flexible, you don't it doesn't matter how many people are playing, as long as you've got a ball, and it occurs in various uh, uh, situations. Whereas deliberate practice, academy centre of excellence, occurs in specialised facilities. Alright? And the danger is to say if we don't manage this deliberate practice environment, will demotivate players. All right, and if you'd seen John Cote came down last year at the GEA, he presented, but that, that was his idea. Look at this picture, right? What's going on here? Who, who's driving? The adult. The adult, and what do you think could really have happened? The child. The child, yeah? Think of the coaching environment. <coughs> Yeah? Coaches spend a lot of time driving and taking charge and, and planting, planting their roots and making decisions. Yeah? So give the kids a chance to put their hands on the steering wheel, make some decisions now and again. And things like this, uh, one of the coaches will say from Ulster, the players are saying, I've got to be somewhere today. And when you hear that coming from a player, it means they're a hassle, doesn't it? Is it, a sound, is it Does it sound like a player has a lot of choice? No. If it's enforcement, it's nearly a military regime, isn't it? Yeah? And in terms of motivation, is that good to see <coughs> uh, this, the, the way they're describing their football or, get, or hurling? Is that good news? I've got to. I've got to. It's not like I want to, is it? I really want to get down to wherever today. Uh, if I miss that session, you know, I'm doing something else. So we're putting our players under a lot of pressure and not making a lot of decisions. Coaches style is interesting. Um, we're looking for player input on and off the pitch and we're key on developing thinking players. Palace, very much about the kids having an input either at half time, before sessions, reviewing things. It's also done online. Adrian McGuckin, he'll be coaching small side, he be coaching the game at Georgetown, we might do three twenty things. And maybe the second period, is you leave the players to tell them what went wrong with the game, what do we need to improve, and then off we go again in our practice, 15 and 15. So, interesting. Alvin Wiley, Northern Ireland women's coach, very experienced, willing again to let players make decisions. What is, let's go back to the message to say here. Your population of players that you're producing, what are they going to become at the end of it? Paid professionals or elite amateurs. Yeah? So the way we manage them is different than Alex Ferguson and his training ground. People might like to think to say it's not. And players need choices. There's a guy that I haven't got a picture, John Royce, he managed several the hockey club. Loads of international players, top fellas, the age of the say in London, whatever. He let them have choice because he kept saying, You've got to be there, and you've got to be there at 7 30 today. And what? what do you mean you're not going to be there Thursday night? What happened to the players? Drift away. Drift away. This can't be bothered. This. Too much hassle. You know, I'm getting grief from my boss. I want a promotion. Yeah? But you can imagine this environment that if we're not careful, we're going to create the wrong atmosphere. And I thought working with those. Those coaches there give me really more insight about what, how we need to be with our coaching. So, avoid the Great Depression in the GAA players. Otherwise, there's going to be a whole lot of players um, drifting away. What's happening if you read the newspapers at the moment? Inter county players. What age are they retiring at? Are they doing Colin Rogues at 38 or what? Where's the, where's, the, where's, the, where's the bar now at the moment? 28, thank you. Yeah? So, that's, you know, this, these are the infinite resources, we've got to look after them, yeah? There's not an endless supply, etc., blah, blah, blah. So, very important. They're, uh, you know, we need to listen to them and look after them. So, feedback is a, is a two way process. We use Sports Tracker. 
It's a system, it's a man from Laos. Um, it's an online system that helps us monitor a palace and we're using it at Gordonstown. Players are to go in and report sleep, rest, what sessions they do and so on, set their goals, a bit of control about their, their football or their sport. The coach is able to provide feedback, there's player full, uh, profiles and weekly feedback and some match analysis, put up the clips and so on. Why is something like that, that type of product important? Why do you think it might be important? Why do you think we might need this? The players given their input. Thank you. The players, their input. Their input. Anything else? Monitor. Monitor them so we know how many games they're playing. In here is a diary so we can put all the fixtures in. Or they'll record how many sessions they're done at the gym and so on. Alright? I said they can set their own goals. What does that give them? Some time on the steering wheel. Yeah, they're allowed to drive now and again. Yeah? And then you can see how they're going. What happens with a lot of things, I think, historically anyway, in sports, not just gay, across all the sports, when it comes to players and training? How do they know if you're tired? What used to normally do? They just look at you, isn't it? Ah, you took a bit late today. Oh, okay. Go too hard. Yeah? So now we're getting a bit more systematic. So at least, even with kids at Palace, we can see from the kids' feedbacks whether they're, they're, they're sleeping the way they well, their quality, their rest, and so on. And you've got a clue. And then because it's on a, on a, on a timeline, you'll know when the games and the training occur, and you see is there a matchup? Does that make sense? So a kid plays badly, but actually if you look at the profile as the coach, you know what, he actually reports a very little sleep that way, or something like that. So what's the problem? Is something going on at home? Is it a timetable too busy? Or is he injured or something like that? Yeah? But we're just going to be a bit more uh, sensitive. Now look, I realise that you know, we're, we're fundamentally part-time coaches. And I think that I'm going to deal with that at the end. Because it's, it's not, as I say, it's not always the coach's fault. All right? And then another little thing that we often use as well um, is an, a match analysis, and we're going to give some feedback. This is performance sports they're based in our man, Danny Turley, and we're using this, uh, this type of product. Why do we need, why do you need match analysis anyways? But what type of feedback does it give? Specific. Specific, objective feedback. You ask your coach, how did so-and-so play? Well, by the time he's, you know, got the balls in and that and that, how much do people remember of an actual game? What percentage of the game do coaches remember? The last 10 minutes. Maybe the last 10 minutes or a key moment, like penalty, a goal, sending off, all of those. It's only about 35% of the game they actually remember from research. So, we want feedback to players that's objective, detailed, not based on biases or personal opinion, and they deserve it. Why do they deserve that type of feedback? You know why you're taking a position to get a in the corner and Yeah, and they're committing a whole load of their, let's call it life, to your excellence program. So the best we can do is give them good feedback. And we can justify our decisions. One of the things we had at Palace was they did three player reports for the year and had to look at it. And then on your scale of one to five, and of course, the, the, the parents said, well, hold on a second. You gave my kid a four the last time. He's excellent at so many of these things, and now you're releasing them. The scale wasn't long enough, yeah? We needed a one to ten, so there was room for improvement. So even your monitoring tools, the most basic ones, um, you need to be good. So I borrowed, I gave them the marketing scheme for one of the essays, and they kind of used it in the <laughs> work in that way. Now, we're going to need to finish off here, uh, because, right, Let's go. I've got about You're five minutes. Five minutes, go. We got that. Governess. There's one man in the room that inspired this slide. Football was great, wasn't it? Set Bladder, it's in the office. And Jack Warner was the guy from Bermuda or someplace. He did all the fiddle on the World Cup tickets. You remember that story? And I, I admit this myself, yeah? So at times, the, the thing was says, oh, by the way, Jack Warner is on the phone line. Yeah, he just covers his ears and pretends he doesn't exist. 
and we've got some issues going on. And one of the ones that was pointed out to me, kindly, was about organising fixtures. You know, it's, it's, it, if we don't get organising fixtures right, then we've got all these hot spots where people are playing four games in five days and all of this. So we need, <coughs> in a county, we need some sort of centralised fixtures calendar, which will go online in your centre of excellence tracking and monitoring system, yeah? And the kid knows exactly, and you know as a coach, oh, we've actually got all the school fixtures through, we've got such and such a squad fixtures through, and we've got all the league. And maybe that's the way to do it, the chance to see the hot spots. The hotspots aren't the same in academies in England because the academy is the main provider of the games. The player will play for their school because to play with their friends and they play county cup competitions, but they won't be playing in all the regular school competition, all right? They're playing county cups in the big games, so the kids engage with their own school friends. But really, the club drives it. So here, where we've got three people with their hands on the steering wheel, clubs, counties and schools, yes? We need to get this coherent structures in place. Um, that will fit in with the online diaries, and we make better decisions. And maybe, maybe the GA needs to say, look, this is a full-time job. And you as coaches need to be giving that feedback to the GA. We really need to get fixtures sorted, so we can all see exactly what the hotspots are. What happened in England was, as well, there's a big change going on. There's this elite player performance plan going on, and all the academies are having to restructure it. Because in the past, the paperwork and the criteria were tight, and anyone could sort of say, oh yeah, we got an academy. But really, they weren't providing all the proper care and, and all the other things that went around with the services. So of course, Crystal Palace would go somewhere to play another club that was an academy, but really when you got there and you looked around, it wasn't really an academy. It was an academy in name, but not in, in real purpose. So good criteria, having real standards, and monitor our academies then that's going to give the child a good experience. And also in terms of fairness, because if some academy isn't really an academy or centre of access, then it shouldn't be pretend to be so, because one county is spending an X amount more money to get it right, and somebody else is cutting a corner. Would you agree? And uh, it'll be a bit harder in football, because your status as an academy is a grade one, two, or three. That could be a, a tool to attract the kids. But I still think we need our real standards and monitor it through and And no kind of say bad practice and people who exaggerate their stages catch them out. So I suppose we need to lead the way in a plan rather than having chaos. John Cote's model for youth development, he wants participation, performance, and personal development. And I thought that was, that was a big reminder for me because all of a sudden I thought, you, we've all been feeling that way, you talk to coaches, but actually this is the research as well. It was lovely because of that Bachelor GA conference. Participation, performance and personal development. Worst case, if we get, and you mentioned this, we don't want players to drift away. We want them to keep playing. Yeah? Ideally performing at a level, but at the same time personal development, developing the people. Okay, this is I don't know if you can read that side. <laughs> the thing with good eyesight are okay, okay, the joke, yeah? Now, what's that really heading towards? Who thinks they're sitting on the top? Go on, go for it. Who do you think sits on the top? The coach or the county? Yeah, it could be the coach or it could be the county, yeah? Our shape and formation is wrong. We need a circle with the player in the middle. Are you happy with that? It's been going on and on for years, a player-centered approach, blah, 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 but now it's starting to get serious about it. Yeah? The player's at the middle of this process of developing their talent. Are we having a win in our developmental approach? And is it about the player and the person? And hopefully you've had a few clear ideas. Answers. We need to understand the demands on the player. We need to engage with parents, see them as useful resources and, and supporters rather than the enemy. Uh, have a very clear philosophy and emphasis on development. So we're all aware of the winning thing and all the pressure puts on kids. So make sure we stick true to development. Use technology where it can to monitor and provide high quality feedback. They deserve it, they've done the work, and parents want and kids want to know reasons why. Organise pictures carefully and recognise the different organisations, not the players' overall department. 
you're all part of the solution as well as part of the problem, yeah? Fixtures, be realistic in your own expectations as a coach and organisation. We're not producing people with, for professional careers with 20 grand a week or whatever it is they're going to earn at the end of it. They're still going to uh, become good athletes and get education and day jobs and function in life. Yeah? Um, have a realistic expectation of the outcomes of your excellence program? Yes. Will everyone play in a county journey, senior jersey out of your excellence program? No. So a lot of them are going to go back into the club and become good club players and recognize that we can't produce uh, all stars every year. Um, look after the players that move through the age bands and have the exit out as well, They're not just dropped and, and left to their own devices. You want them to play in terms of motivation, develop and enjoy gaming games. Because otherwise they're going to drop out of them. Allow them to think for themselves and make decisions. Remember, youths play the sport for numerous reasons other than excellence. There's a social part of it. Being liked by other people, having friends, a social network, all of those things. It's not always about excellence, even though they're in excellence programs. Experience, knowledge, and unqualified coaches. We need the best people who understand youths and different kids' age bands, and then who are qualified to work with kids through their excellence programs. Put the player and the person first at the center, and there's life outside and after the game. games. All right, guys. We have two minutes questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. a lot there. But... For Tracker, where you were talking about uh, players in the academy putting in their own uh, nutrition and how they were performing, do you not think that's like overkill that if a guy's doing badly, he's gonna, it's going to be reinforcing that he's doing badly? It is, but then you part of the process as well is you helping the kid recognize how to evaluate performance. So the younger inexperienced ones will, oh, we lost, that would be their first thing, yeah? Or I just played badly. But they might think, well, I might have been slow going to the ball, but actually when I got the ball and distributed it, it was all right. So you're getting an insight into what they're thinking, all right? Because unless you spend a lot of time conversing with your players and having loads of one-on-one -on -one meetings, you never know what they're thinking, which is great. Do you have time for that? No, because we're part-time coaches. And it's the same in academies in England, that all the people who work with what we call the 9 to 14 or 15, a lot of them are part-time. And they get the same answer as themselves about day jobs, bombing into training, doing the training, and giving feedback, and so on. So an online too creates more work, but it might be somewhere else where you're at home and then manage your communication with your player. But it's still a good question. They might be too critical, but we can educate them. Any other questions? Just though you were talking about the, you know, not every person in your academy make it to the training you tell them. We have a lot of our club, not even accent player, midfielder, you know, just only the main thing on it. He was always <coughs> But he was every development squad in the county, only was 14 and 15, right up. And he didn't make it to the senior level in the county. So it just took about three years to you know, that that first football is actually absolutely abysmal. And this last year was the first year after three years. So what does this conversation highlight to you? The role of which organization? That club. Because if they lose the link with their club, their isolation is dropped. You really know me, yeah? You thought that he was coming back tonight. His attitude to the coaches that probably are not spot based the way it's in the That he was he was bad practice and really over players. I know he had the the accident. He wasn't bringing the back of his club in the park where they could only be And then he fell away from the parents' structure. His form suffered. So can you see what they need this link with their club all the time? You can't let players lose touch with their club because the club's going to be there with county managers and excellence directors change their minds. It's the club they go back to. Yeah, so that club link is not to be respected and valued. Yeah, that's why I bring the, the birds out of that. I just want to thank Jim uh, for a very stimulating presentation. I think this final slide is a great handout to have. It's a great guy. I think everything is really very well summarised there. Um, so thanks for your, your attendance uh, for this session and uh, we'll just change of work wherever you're going next.